So I'm happy to welcome everybody. Thank you everybody for uh, your patience of a slight delay. Um, here we are uh, ready to welcome two uh, great experts, distinguished scholars and researchers, and I will keep the introductions short um, so that we um, have the maximum amount of time to listen to their new work. Um, I welcome first Celeste uh, Gonzalez de Bustamante, who is a professor at the School of Journalism, um, also a PhD in history, if I may add that, um, and who currently directs the Center for Border and Global Journalism. Um, she is placing great emphasis in her work on creating awareness about the dangerous conditions that journalists face around the world. And as you will see, we'll talk about the context of Mexico through their new work. She has published widely in peer-reviewed journals um, and uh, scholarly monographs. And um, she has also worked 15 years as a journalist before um, coming to the University of Arizona. So uh, welcome, Dr. Gonzalez de Bustamante. Next, um, an equally distinguished scholar, Janine Riley, also at the, a professor at the School of Journalism, currently the director of global initiatives for the School Center for Border and Global Journalism. Dr. Riley's uh, research focuses on global influences on news media systems and democratic institutions and freedom of expression. She has also um, has uh, collected a lot of international experience in co collaborations and publications with colleagues in different countries and has worked as a journalist as well for over a decade. So uh, welcome to both of you. We are looking forward to your introduction of an exciting subject and new book titled Surviving Mexico, Resistance and Resilience Among Journalists in the 21st Century, um, a volume that has just been published with University of Texas Press. Thank you so Welcome. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yadviga Piper Mooney. And uh, thank you for inviting us to share this research. I, I feel, especially at home here, uh, so to speak, uh, virtually, <laughs> given th my longtime uh, connection to the center and that the fact that the Center for Latin American Studies supported this work um, and helped us to do some of the research for the book, as well as the Confluence Center and, and many other um, entities um, on campus and off campus too. So I wanted to let you know that um, you were the center and others have been um, great supporters of the work and allowed us to to get to this point and so i'm going to share my screen here and so here we see uh, this is the image that is on, on the book cover and this is an image taken by Jose Luis Palacio, Gonzalez Palacios, who's an esteemed photojournalist in Ciudad Juarez. And this image is taken uh, at a checkpoint outside of a prison in uh, Ciudad Juarez where they were holding El Chapo Guzman before he was transferred, extradited to the United States. And so um, I just wanted to mention Jose Luis Gonzalez Palacio and his extraordinary work and the fact that he helped us um, with the with the book. Um, and so let's see if I can, uh, we thought we would start off giving you um, just a little bit of a um, update as to what the conditions are like currently our work looks at um, 2000 to 2020, although we do look uh, at this issue from a historical perspective. So we go beyond, um, go back before 2000, of course. But here we have this slide by Articulo 19 in Mexico. Uh, and this is one of their first annual, uh, first reports this year in the first trimester, uh, semester, um, saying that every 12 hours, a journalist, it, is attacked in Mexico. Uh, 
and that a uh, total of um, 362 attacks have happened just in this first semester of, of, the, of the year. And that another statistic that we used often, unfortunately have to use to describe the level of violence is the fact that a journalist a month basically is being killed in Mexico. And that's been the case for several years. And we're seeing a lot of the journalists who are killed, are, they're not the national level journalists. They are the journalists who are on the periphery, extreme periphery, um, such as this journalist Jacinto Romero Flores, who was killed in August in uh, Veracruz, in the state of Veracruz, one of the most dangerous country, um, uh, one of the most dangerous states in Mexico for, for journalists. And, here, there's a quote here um, saying that um, from somebody who was working at this news outlet and where Jacinto was working, that she uh, or he was, was speaking on condition of anonymity for fear of suffering reprisal. A spokes a woman um, for the station told Reuters that Reuters that Romero had received threats uh, for his professional work and. I'm put, we put this quote in there just because I think it's, it speaks to the level of fear among um, many journalists, especially in these areas that we would call the extreme periphery. And so just a little bit of context to, for our study. And I would say, um, Janine, you can jump in too. We probably didn't set out to have uh, this longitudinal study, we, um, but actually in the end, it ended up being very advantageous for us to be able to look at this long period of time so we can see how things evolved, are changing and somehow, and sometimes not changing. And sometimes in terms of the violence getting worse over the, the period that we're, we're looking at. And so the slide that you're looking at now um, shows some of the, the criminal organizations, the main criminal organizations in the various states. And you can see there, are, you know, almost a dozen operating throughout the country. and. This is sort of like an aerial view of these cartels, uh, organized crime groups that are operating in, in all this, pretty much all the states in, in the country. One thing we should mention is that although there might be um, one criminal group, Sinaloa, for example, in Sonora, that doesn't mean that it's the only organized crime group, um, this, getting to the point of this being somewhat of an aerial view. And the history point here is that the, we see here a very fractionalized picture of organized crime groups in Mexico. Whereas if you were to look at the organized crime groups that were operating in Mexico in the mid 1980s, there would be maybe two or three big uh, crime groups. And what happened is the historic part of this is the, these criminal groups really started fractionalizing way back in the 1980s after the death of um, Enrique Quique, Quique Camarena, who was a DEA agent and killed in um, the state of um, Jalisco in um, trying to pursue uh, some of the heads of the criminal groups back then. So this has been a long process, the, the fractionalization of criminal groups and then exacerbated in 2006 when Felipe Calderon became president and launched an all out quote unquote drug war against um, criminal, criminal groups leading to, to even more fractionalization. And so you see here, it doesn't really matter uh, whether it's somebody from the PAN, the uh, um, or the PRI or the new party and Morena party, you see that there are journalists who are being killed in Mexico. This is the breakdown of journalists being killed by presidential administration. You see though with Vicente, I'm sorry, um, 
Felipe Calderon coming into office, there's starting to be a, a spike in his administration. And so this is partly related to the fact that of the organized, uh, the all out kind of war against organized crime groups. And at the same time, increased violence um, in throughout the country in also mainly in the Northern states at this particular time. So here's a, a graph of how this translates or translated for journalists. You see that journalists pretty much in every state of the country have been killed where we want the, some points we want to make here with this map. There are particular states where journalists um, are being killed more than in other states, such as in the state of Chihuahua, Tamaulipas, Veracruz, and what we use is this framework of um, periphery and extreme periphery. So even though Chihuahua is not necessarily considered, you know, economically a peripheral state, in terms of the the environment for journalists, the political situation for journalists who are working in the maybe very remote, isolated areas of the state. That's where some of these journalists are being killed in Chihuahua. And Tamaulipas, um, there, the, there is an economic sort of tie to the, the number of journalists and same for Veracruz where you know, the, econo the economics of the state, the economies are, are poorer and journalists tend to have less um, training, less uh, formal training with journalism. And that's not to say that because they have less formal training that is going to get them killed, but they, they might become more vulnerable because they perhaps don't have the training for dealing with um, sources, for how to handle information, which can cause them to, um, to be more, more vulnerable in many cases. So I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Relly, to take it from here. Great, thank you so much, um, Dr. Gonzalez de Bustamante, and thank you for having us, everyone. Uh, so, uh, you know, just uh, following up a little bit too on what was said regarding the, uh, what we were looking at at the beginning, um, just to give you a sense and how it's a, a bit changed over time, over the 10 years, we started our first paper um, in the International Journal of Press Politics was titled Silencing Mexico. So we we did at the beginning, uh, before we started looking at resistance and resilience, we're looking at all the things that were going wrong and, and kind of the reactions. We were looking at it more as responses to the violence. And then um, thanks to um, Dr. Gonzalez, we uh, she said, hey, you know, Look at these. We were looking at these different sparks of, of you know, basically resilience and people going out on the streets and protesting um, journalists. That is, and um, so one of the things we did, uh, you know, well into this five years in, is we we did revisit a lot of the transcripts and and work that we had done, and then we continued on doing more interviews, focusing in a different way. So we we have had a lot of research questions, uh, but the book really uh, frames around uh, looking at um, the context uh, of increasing violence toward journalists in the profession, and and how did the, did journalists survive and persist? So, you know, these are some rough definitions of resistance and some real resilience working definitions that we use. And this is a qualitative, you know, it's an inductive study. Um, so for resistance, um, conscious acts to individuals and collective, uh, collectively opposing adverse and threatening conditions with the intent to improve safety, professional autonomy, and the field as, the whole, as a whole. So a lot of professional aspects to it, um, but also personal too. So uh, we'll talk about the different levels that we, we looked at this from. And then resilience would be the ability to continue to function uh, professionally and to create, adapt, and resist in the face.
face of trauma and violence. And the reason it, it being so important is in many um, societies that purport or are trying to be democratic um, or somewhere in the middle or politically transitioning, uh, you know, news journalists are who technically bring information to large public. So they tend to represent um, a bigger, something, you know, a bit bigger in some ways um, than maybe individuals. We can go to the next slide then. So our methods over time, we, we used a lot of different methods, but historical research and oral histories. Um, we also um, had, you know, multiple, we did an organiza organizational studies, we did individual level studies. And so we had different questionnaires for different groups, um, you know, that the IRB approved. So we had, um, you know, individual journalists and news organizations. That was our first study. I think we, you know, we interviewed almost 60 people for that study. And then the second batch was like networks and organizations related um, related organizations. So um, we did organizations uh, at the intergovernmental level, like UN type organizations and affiliates. We did transnational NGOs that are advocacy organizations like um, like uh, you know the Committee to Protect Journalists or the International Center for Journalists. Uh, that are, you know, reporters without borders um, that have, you know, work in many, many countries. And then we did domestic, we did regional and then domestic level organizations that were advocacy oriented, grassroots organizations. Um, and then we did some, we interviewed academics as well. So we had three, three working questionnaires uh, for those. And then we looked at documents, UN documents, uh, you know, historical documents, uh, government data and records. Um, but it was all very descriptive and, uh, you know, the, the analyses were, um, so we would characterize this as qualitative in the network analysis because, as you all know, it's so hard to get your arms all the way around every organization doing everything. I mean, it, you know, we found it not possible. Um, so it is a qualitative network analysis that we did. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. So this is uh, the table of contents of our um, book, and you can see from this kind of, you know, this will sort of lay out our findings that we'll talk about briefly here. But the first section, part one, the introduction really lays out the issue. And, um, you know, the biggest issue, the most glaring issues are the, um, you know, the killing of nearly a journalist a month, you know, sort of going on for years. Uh, and uh, the abuses uh, and uh, threats and, um, you know, issues that emanate beyond the journalists. They, they emanate into their, you know, to family networks, into communities. So a lot of really great history. Um, and then, um, and, and kind of how there's some repetition over, you know, outside of the window of, of our study the last 20 years. Um, and then we look at uh, murdering, the second section is on murdering the messenger and their uh, we look at um, some of the, the the ways that journalists have resisted some of these um, some of these structures that have been put in place, like um, like news organizations being called by um, organized crime group heads, or you know, just telling them not to publish things and waiting for them. So red light, green light, yes, you can publish, no, you can't. Um, types of things and workarounds that journalists and um, news organizations did in those environments. Uh, we looked at the personal and familial toll from a trauma-informed perspective. So um, this section looked at um, not only the trauma, right, but then the emotional, um, the emotional intelligence that a lot of these journalists employed, you know, began just intuitively and then through it, you know, lots of psychological help and other methods of family. Uh, friends, um, how they managed in this situation and continue to manage. So that's a, a, the the takeaways from that are pretty pretty big, and we'll we'll get to that in a little bit. And then um, uh, looking at how um, uh, navigation in these very dangerous places occurred on social media, and how um, the, while in some environments folks were digitally insecure, there was this massive effort of resistance to train hundreds of journalists and others, human rights defenders in the country uh, on digital security and safety. So that was an interesting sort of resistance resilience uh, area. And then we looked at um, 
attempts of, to intervene on the behalf of journalists by everything from governments pouring you know, millions of dollars into these programs on all kinds of levels, policy levels, legal levels, judicial levels, military levels, um, all related to protecting journalists, right? And then journalists themselves and their communities, um, even down to uh, money for psychological care and setting up the mechanismo, um, which is supposed to be a setup uh, that the government provides, um, you know, provides response for journalists um, who are at risk. And then we looked at uh, the 20 year history of all these different administrations and um, how they changed uh, laws related to corruption at the state and federal level and um, uh, protection of journalists at the state and, and national level and um, the, 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 some of the issues that um, made those, a lot of those attempts, and there were attempts in every administration, how they um, panned out. And then uh, we have women on the front line, which um, uh, Dr. Gonzalez will talk about a little bit more. And then we did um, a you know a conclusion, which is really just uh, basically uh, you know a wrap, and then recommendations for what what you know what we recommend going forward. And then the appendix uh, has um, you know a list of all of the journalists who have been killed uh, over the the twenty year period of this study. And it's quite extensive. Um, I, this is just uh, the organizational level aspect of the study. These were the different entities that we looked at. We looked at in the state, you know, the, uh, our, the dark networks or the organized crime groups, and we didn't study them directly. We looked at them indirectly through accounts of, you know, government, intergovernmental groups, transnational groups, academics, and, and journalists themselves. Um, we did, we did uh, you know, some government interview, government level interviews and used their data. Um, and we, we talked to a lot of grassroots uh, domestic organizations. Uh, we talked to, you know, I, I think three or four um, representatives from UN agencies, uh, and then uh, lots of transnational groups, and then uh, then other other governments uh, that were involved. Particularly, the, the U.S. invested a lot of quite a bit of money uh, in this project. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then um, just uh, a wrap here on findings. Um, you know, the study looked at different types of resistance, which um, Dr. Gonzalez will get into, um, that often intertwined with, you know, the resistance of the ways of resisting supported and nurtured, uh, if you will, uh, and sustained resilience. And uh, we actually suggest and think going forward, we think it would be really interesting and important to look at some of these factors in for other first responder types of conditions, because journalists really are first responders um, in terms of going, you know, like firefighters, like emergency workers, they see and experience a lot of things that other other sectors of society don't. Um, and you find there is literature on um, looking at resilience in those communities, not so much in journalism communities. So some of the other sustaining factors that we found um, were in the network area. And because this was a qualitative study, um, we uh, were not really able to like count out and parse out like the weights of all of these different networks and how they work centered. They really they were all kind of present. And so to what extent one might've been more powerful than the other. But if you look at this cross-sectional map of Mexico in one year of our study, this is, you know, you don't have to look at the details. This is one organization involved, Freedom House. This is, this is their project work, their network work inside of Mexico one year. So you can imagine there are other organizations doing projects as well, right? So this is kind of a map or an example of uh, all of the different actors, if you will, who are involved. So there were professional networks, there were intergovernmental networks linked with governments, linked with INGOs, linked to this day, actually, linked with domestic NGOs. There were political and policy networks. There were legal networks, there were psychological support networks, some formal, lots of informal. Um, there were community networks, and then of course academic and professional networks, and then personal networks, which you know obviously are essential. And then the next slide. There you go. 
All right, so I'm just going to dig a little deeper on the idea of resistance. And we ended up categorizing them in, in terms of everyday and extraordinary levels of uh, and types of resistance. And then um, parsing that out into the, the professional, personal levels to um, their reporting practices, and then the types of uh, equipment and or technology or physical exper uh, appearances. So I'm not gonna go through all of these things, but you can just see if we took a look at uh, the professional and personal, it really has become an, this everyday sort of um, practice to self-censor. And we found that throughout the country, whether they the journalists were working in the, what we would consider periphery or extreme periphery, they, they worked in some way to establish personal safety protocols. And then extraordinary measures in this particular category would be leaving the country to work uh, somewhere else. There are dozens of journalists who are working in the United States, um, some working as journalists, some working as other, you know, having to take on other professions and other types of work, journalists in Canada, Europe, uh, so within Europe, Spain and Germany. Uh, sometimes uh, they register with or state or federal, the federal protection mechanisms that have been um, have been created that Janine was just talking about or deciding not to register with state or federal mechanisms because what happens is there's so little trust sometimes in government entities that uh, there's a fear that registering with these mechanisms that are set up to protect journalists will actually put them more at risk. So that's another point that I think is important to note is that the just huge variety of responses among the journalists, depending on where they are, what time uh, that we're talking about versus 2010 in Juarez is much different than uh, what's happening in Juarez um, today or what was happening in Juarez like five years ago. So these, these uh, categories of resistance and response is sort of provide a snapshot, but the snapshots, I guess, it's more like a video, but uh, we don't have that ability to do that in print form, you know, and, and to have that many snapshots going on. So then um, if we would continue these different categories of resistance, there are some on-scene precautions, uh, so meaning on the crime scene in particular, so they would um, communicate their itineraries. These would be like everyday measures, communicate their, what, where they're going with their newsroom supervisors, um, an extraordinary measure in terms of how to cover difficult situations or crime scenes would be, um, it, it, we, we found in one case, this uh, exercising caution when handling camera equipment. So if you were to, See, be in the in the midst of a, let's say a balacera shootout. The camera, a video camera, could be appear to be a weapon in some cases if you're you know at a far distance. So we know of journalists who actually uh, made sure that they put their newsroom stickers and basically, you know, added in, uh, information, if you will to the, their setup so that they wouldn't look like they were carrying uh, weapons and to, as a form of protection. And then we'll get into this a little bit more, this cross-media collaboration. So journalists, uh, uh, when crime and when the violence really started erupting in certain areas, journalists started to band together from different media. So Oftentimes you'll, you'll hear about journalists from a same media outlet working together, but what was happening is in cities like Ciudad Juarez, journalists from different organizations would contact each other and go to crime scenes together as a form of self-protection, which hadn't happened previously because if you know anything about journalism, it's a highly competitive 
profession. People want to get the scoop, if you will. They want to get exclusives. And that just completely went out the window in terms of a goal or an objective when violence skyrocketed in some of these communities. Um, in some more extraordinary cases, you would have journalists um, who maybe had information that could result in a story for their own publication would share that that information with other news organizations so that they could publish at the same time because if everybody's publishing about something a hot topic it's more difficult to go after you know 10 journalists versus one or sometimes even sending that information across borders to have the information published in the united states or outside of mexico as a way to get the information out but stay safe. Those would be considered what we would be considered extraordinary measures. And then another extraordinary measure, this relates to the resistance and resilience, it would be banding together to form organizations like Janine was referring to these um, networks, journalist networks. Um, this is one example of um, journalists banding together to support Miroslava breach, or at least her case, um, to really as a response to the high levels of impunity in Mexico with respect to crimes against journalists in Mexico, uh, maybe one out of 10 cases does get solved. And in fact, this case of Miroslava breach was killed in 2017, did get solved. A, um, a uh, suspect was apprehended, he went to trial and was actually convicted. But that is really, truly um, an exception. And then um, uh, wrapping up here, you heard us talk about the Juarez Journalist Network. It's really a, um, a good example of a, a strong network of journalists. And uh, in the in a dissertation defense that I was just in uh, with a student who's graduating who did a very in-depth analysis of all of these networks that have been formed. There have been something like 20, there are now at least 21 of these types of networks, journalist networks in Mexico throughout the country. And some of them are using and have used um, the Red de Periodistas de Juarez as a model as well as the national level organization, the Red de Periodistas um, de a Pie, which is based in, in Mexico City. And these two networks, the Red de Periodistas de a Pie in Mexico City and this um, network in Juarez, interestingly, has been um, lead, they've been led by women primarily. Um, they're female dominated organizations. Not to say that men aren't part of them. They have men who are uh, members and participate, but it's basically the women who are doing a lot of the work, who organized and who created the networks. And so you see here in this photo here, um, four of the five women who created the Red de Periodistas de Juarez, um, Lucy Sosa, starting from left to right, and then Rocio Gallegos, Aradi Castañón, and Sandra Rodriguez, they all were working together at El Diario, um, de, um, El Diario de Ciudad Juarez. And all of these women too got, um, MA, uh, got MA degrees uh, outside of the country to strengthen their knowledge about journalism. So they have a higher level of, of expertise. And that's not to say because they went and studied in the US, they're better journalists, it's just that they were able to study and that that um, opportunity was actually supported by their, um, the owners of that publication, which is, is somewhat of an exception. Now um, I am going to play a short video if I, Hopefully it will work. And basically the video I'm going to play in a second, just to set it up, is uh, uh, comments uh, and a, uh, just a, a bit of, from an interview that we did with Rocio Gallegos who helped to just start the Red de Periodistas de Juarez and also is now the head editor of a publication that's connected to the network called La Verdad, The Truth. And it's an online organization and they do a very, very uh, high quality investigative journalism. And so let me see if I can pull that up. 
play that for you. Oops, I just realized. I just realized I think I need to share my screen first. Yeah. Bear with me here. Here we go. Volteo hacia atrás y siento un orgullo a los periodistas Juárez. Muy fuerte. Porque, disculpen, pero me, me quiebra porque me tocó dirigir equipo de periodistas en esa época directamente y no nada más hablo con los colegas del diario. O sea, estoy hablando por los colegas de Ciudad Juárez. Radio, prensa, televisión. Estaban ahí. Había pools. O sea, no sabíamos cómo actuar. De repente buscábamos a quién podía ser el líder del grupo acá. Se buscaban pool para ir a cubrir tal cosa que representara un riesgo para el periodista, para que no fuera solo. Buscábamos la manera de seguir haciendo nuestro trabajo. Por eso yo siento que es de mucha valentía y de mucho orgullo lo que hicieron muchos de nuestros colegas. Fue algo más allá de las empresas periodísticas. Más allá de las empresas periodísticas. Fue un trabajo que realmente hizo el periodista de, de a pie y en la calle. So I, I think it's important to note also that um with the, the Red de Periodistas de Juarez, they had two journalists. One, you saw the, the banners, one for El Choco, um, Armando Rodriguez, who was killed in 2008, and then another journalist in 2010, um, Santiago. And these were, you know, sent basically shockwaves throughout their newsroom and really was were kind of a catalyst in, in creating, um, I guess, collective, uh, you know, um, outrage, collective outrage, and also an impetus for creating the network when they had these colleagues being killed in their own newsroom. And that, that is something that we've found in uh, other networks too. Like there, there are, oftentimes there was a catalyst of a journalist being ex brutally um, attacked or possibly even killed, and that um, motivated, inspired journalists to, to band together to create some of these networks. So with that, I think I'm going to stop talking so we can leave some time for questions. Thank you so much again for uh, allowing us to present our work here today. Great. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing this important work. Um, I would like to open up for questions. We have about 15 minutes and we can see how we do that, either collect three questions in a row or go one by one. I see um, Tom Ze, would you like to start? It wasn't really the, the, the raise hand, it was just a applaud. Oh, I see. I'm yeah. sorry about that. Thank it's you. okay. You may uh, raise your hand or put questions in the chat um, or just show yourself, wave and ask a question. We work with real people also, not just with little symbols on the screen. Um, so, Questions, comments, observations. Liz, please, you would like to start? Um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much, Janine and Celeste, for this really uh, important work. Um, I've 
always admired your work for a very long time and I'm, I'm so glad to see this book out. Uh, thank you so much for coming to give this talk. I have so many questions that I wish I could just sit down and just talk with you um, over coffee. Um, but I think the question that I will ask is, um, I, I wanted to ask a, a bit more about the transnational alliances and especially alliances um, with other Latin American journalists um, or, or it could be even outside of Latin America. But um, uh, how did you see that maybe factoring? If you could maybe say a little bit more about how that might factor in um, in people's resilience or, or what Lat how can Latin American journalists who are threatened um, particularly those who maybe work at the local level who aren't um, as well recognized, how can they support each other? Mm -hmm. You want me to go, Janine, then, and then you can add. Sure, yeah, that's great. And, and thank you, Liz. Yes, and so we'll much. have to catch up on another coffee. Um, but great. let me just try to take a stab the at this question, it's so important, these transnational alliances that, that in some cases, they're just uh, part of the same sort of border communities, right? So you have transnationalism in the US-Mexico border where you have journalists who had longstanding relationships uh, with uh, colleagues and friends from, I'm thinking of uh, Juarez and El Paso in particular, and also in, in Tijuana, San Diego, all throughout the border area, actually, but in particular, Juarez, um, El Paso, San Diego, um, and Tijuana, where journalists already had these alliances and friendships uh, in place. And then when things got worse, they would draw on the, those connections. And then um, they also, when things started really, um, you know, spiraling downward in terms of the violence. They looked to their colleagues in um, Colombia, for example, uh, periodistas de a pie, Marcela Turate, Turati has worked a lot with um, Fundacion um, 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 the Fundaciones de, in Colombia. And so they worked very closely with those journalists and these networks, I think, are essential for getting messages out. So creating visibility through social media and otherwise, and um, also for creating just a sense that they're not alone in this sort of thing. And they're also learning from one another. So they've had different, um, now with the pandemic, they've had to do a lot of these things online, but previously they were actually meeting in person, either in Mexico City or other you know, capitals in, um, in Latin America to train each other, to learn from each other. So that I think has been, I guess if you could say that there was like a shining moment um, and there has been a, an increase in solidarity among journalists nationally, internationally. I mean, that is not to say that, you know, everything is, you know, hunky-dory and kumbaya because there's a lot of tension sometimes with you know, these organizations, but I'm going to leave it at that so that Janine can maybe talk about the network side of this. Thank you. That's so true, though. Um, so that is such a great question from the standpoint of the Latin American journalists, because when we were asking folks, um, you know, who their who who their supporters were. Um, we didn't hear a lot about uh, organizations in other countries, although um, we did, uh, you know, that could be different now. Um, I, you know, one thing that's happening currently in a lot of these countries, including Mexico, are these incredible uh, fact-checking groups are, are rising up and, and forming, um, and they're sharing information. So there is a global sort of, dis you know, uh, response to disinformation network, which ties in with all of this too, because obviously disinformation environments create chaos and make it much less safe. So that that's going on. But a lot of what we heard about was largely uh, we were talking about transnational organizations like Paris based, DC based, New York based, um, and then the UN kind of 
you know, so there's this whole thing that's going on and it's been going on for decades, which I'm sure you know about, which is these transnational and UN, you know, intergovernmental organizations at the UN level are working to make environments safer for journalists around the world. And they're trying to, they're creating this sort of rollout sort of guidelines in, in every state and country. So they, those folks go into these communities and tell uh, communities about what other folks or do, other journalists are doing in other countries. I think, but Celeste, you know, her point about um, Colombia is exact, you know, that was one connection because there was, um, you know, so they were using Colombia as a model for how things could maybe improve and, and how the conditions were different. And one of the biggest ones that journalism Mexico kept telling us was the, um, there was less of a camaraderie and, um, you know, less of what is considered like a, a, a guild, if you will, or an, or, you know, a big collective of journalists in Mexico. There was so much kind of rivalry and competition where in Colombia there was much more unity and that made it harder. Uh, to get things going, but they they did seem to overcome that, and I'll I'll kind of leave it at that. I think you could you'd have a, an amazing study list to look at at this network in in Latin America. I bet it I bet it's powerful, and I'm sure it would. I'm sure it's going on, uh, you know, to a certain extent, and I'm guessing it 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 surely should support um, resilience. You know, I can't imagine it wouldn't. So, for your next book, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question and the answers. I do not see an immediate next question, so I'll use the opportunity. Oh, no, there's Colin. Yeah, you go. Yeah, first, I wanted Colin. to thank you for the presentation. I want to uh, mention that I put a link to the to the book uh, in the chat for everybody that's interested, right, to the UT Press. Uh, and then Dr. Kathleen Schwartzman uh, put a question in the chat. So uh, she was at wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the differences in the government's reactions, right, to the uh, you know the murders of the journalists. Mm -hmm. Governments in Mexico different, like local versus net federal. Celeste, or oh. well, different administrations, uh, perhaps. Yes, D different administrations. What were their attempts? You showed the statistics, but. Well, yeah, I mean, that's an, a fabulous question, Kathleen, because, and I'll let Janine um, chime in too, because you see there were just dozens of uh, attempts to ameliorate the situation on paper. And as everybody in this room knows, Mexico's got some amazing uh, policies and procedures and laws, but when you put those into action, you know, that's the, in reality, they don't actually do what they're intended to do. But you see with, um, you know, with the Calderon, uh, Fox Calderon, even um, Enrique Peña Nieto, they outwardly, I'm talking about just the di public discourse and how president, you know, at a presidential level, they were handling this, were you know, pretty supportive, saying that they were supportive of the journalists and the, you know, concerned about the plight of journalists in Mexico. And even during Calderon's administration, they passed a federal law that making a crime against a journalist, journalist or a human rights worker a federal crime and establishing these mechanisms to protect journalism, journalists and creating a panic button for journalists. The then, you know, you get to um, Lopez Obrador, who has been not so supportive of this uh, plight and, and this situation. In fact, he's gone so far as to criticize um, Article 19 that has done tremendous work in that country. And we could talk about dependency on um, these international organizations, but you know, they've done some great work with uh, local people running those, uh, the, the um, national chapters. Uh, and he has been critical of them and, and of journalists, he, you know, so this is part of a trend globally of um, somewhat authoritarian, um, populist uh, authoritarian sort of governments that we see even in the United States. And so they're, they're also talking about alliances and who's listening and watching who and how they're being influenced the, you know, at the presidential level, people are 
they, these presidents are watching and learning, unfortunately, in, in some cases from each other in a negative way. Um, but that's all I will say for, you know, hopefully that answers your question, but I would just, and to wrap up on the local, these crimes are happening on the local level and they're investigated first by local officials. And until they determine that it was a crime that related to the journalist's work, which is problematic because the local governments um, and the local law enforcement tend to be much more corrupt than at the national level. So they often you know, have very shoddy investigations. It, it, they will come up with uh, explanations like oh, it was just a crime of um, opportunity. And so the journalists, it was, had nothing to do with the journalist's work, even though they took the journalists' uh, cameras, computers, all the things that were related to what the journalists need to do their work. Um, so that's, that's another thing that's made it difficult um, in terms of the question of impunity. Janine, did you want to yeah, I know that's exactly. And so, you know, the um, and, and in some cases they even defame, you know, the person who's dead. So it's like, you know, even double, you know, doubly difficult for the, the families and the impunity rate right there is is up at like, you know, less than one in 10, you know, um, like 90, uh, 95 to 100 percent, 95 percent of the uh, crimes are like not um not investigated, prosecuted, and um, you know, and taken all the way out. So uh, it's a very difficult country for that type of thing. You, you probably, I'm sure you probably know that. So, if you did a textual analysis of the work of the reporters who died, what percentage would you say has to do with cartels and drugs? I mean, I. So you know this the statistics on the killings and and the types of beats or the types of uh, focus foci of the reporters is um it, or or sorry the attackers are the majority are a uh, government that that's self declared you know attacks are from the government but there's a huge unknown, unknown category is it over thirty percent Celeste it's it's pretty high yeah. and you know we kind of know who that what that category is right and then and then in terms of um, to answer your question a lot there's so um, politics corruption um, I don't know if they break it out by drugs I don't know if we have a, a diagram yeah it's more like a crime they're covering crime beats government. Uh, any sort of government agency could be anything from uh, law enforcement to courts to anything related to to local or, or state government tends to. The other thing that puts them in more precarious positions is because of their economic situation, they're often having to take on more than one job. So oftentimes you'll find, especially in these extreme periphery peripheral areas, journalists are working uh, for a local media outlet, working for um, some other government entity, it could be even a prison system, which we know, uh, you know, they're highly corrupt or even a government entity, you know, the municipal government, for example, which creates conflicts of interest and possible put, possibly puts them more at risk. Thank you. I um, should note that we are almost out of time and that uh, perhaps for the last segment we collect um, uh, a few questions so that some people, including myself, get their questions in still. So I'll just um, get a, a quick reference uh, to one of the, one of the, the, the uh, chapters in your book that I'm very impressed by that refers directly to recommendations for going forward. And I would like to hear a bit more about that since um, mm -hmm. it's great to see that your work um, has potential for you know, very practical implications. Mm -hmm. And then I think that, that Tom's hand now is a now it's, a, now it's a, it's a Now it's a question. Please. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, thanks for the great presentation, um, you both, right? Um, I was thinking in terms of advancing the theories of violence that you're, because you normally think about that in terms of theory of violence normally as either individual direct violence perpetrated by one person. And then or if you take it to the structural level, like it's a lot has been done in, about anti-Black violence, the structural level, like in education, 
as access to resources. But it seems that your work in fascinating ways is problematizing and, and expanding what we know about the theories of violence, right? because it's it's a combination of different things so it's 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 really fascinating that um i don't know if you plan to do that and then maybe for the next book to do something specifically on um, the theory of violence right based on all this ground data that you have right so can you talk more about it that's a great idea (laughs) <laughs> we could talk to you more about that. <laughs> Celeste, I don't know if you want to go ahead with that or. Sure. Do we want to take one more question or just go um, with you? The last chance question, anybody? Last chance for now, I should say. Um, for in this meeting, because there's option. Yeah, please. Hi, how's it going? I'm considering, I'm not just considering, I'm actually changing my research agenda. I'm associate professor uh, in journalism mass communication at Southern Illinois Edwardsville, and I'm interested in researching uh, institutional attacks on the press in the United States because it's becoming a growing issue. It's not, it, it's Trump, post-Trump, and and many other things, the rise of, of you know, right-wing fascism in the United States, collaborations between CPAC and Hungary, for Christ's sakes, like there's a lot going on in, in this country. Um, uh, is it fair to draw comparisons is my question, or should I be more careful in trying to talk about institutions against the press or, or organizing or interpolating contrary to the press and the service of democracy in the United States? Because it's not the same overall you know, geopolitical situation. No, you're yeah. right, Mark. Um, well, these are all fascinating questions. Maybe I'll, I'll take a stab at a couple and then turn things over to Janine, but um, I'll start with Mark's first. I think uh, we in the United States often hear so many, uh, you know, this is a broad sort of generalization, but there's a lot of discourse of trying to distance the United States from what is happening in Mexico and to, to show how the cases are different, but in actuality, they're very similar. Uh, you know, in terms of the media pressures, the economics, the economic models that most media, at least on a large scale, uh, follow. And the, you know, certainly the pressures from the government are a little bit different. Um, Mexico has a long history of being um, this issue of uh, government publicity and paying for advertising in in publications and on television puts them, you know, in a more sort of dependent position. That's a longstanding issue that doesn't necessarily happen in the United States. It's more about um, big, big corporations that are controlling big media in the United States. So that's different. But, you know, it's this capitalist structure that is impeding um, and constraining journalists in in many ways. So I think there are a lot of similarities and that I, I wouldn't say that that's a bad idea that um, you'd certainly have to problematize that and make sure you know what you're comparing and all of those things but there's a lot to be compared and contrasted um in terms of the recommendations moving forward yadviga we you know it's sort of hard to say after a study like this okay this you know and being a a researcher being researchers based in the United States, here's what you need to do, you know, and so we're not saying that we're saying, you know, here's some things to think about. Here's what we found works. And what we've found has worked are these networks. And then so what we in terms of creating a way forward, and perhaps ameliorating and improving the situation would be strengthening these networks. Um, continued support of these networks uh, from international, uh, the international level, but also then related to that is have looking for ways to in, include and involve the public, the the, gen, the, the wider public, but because that is a, a big uh, deficit in um, in in Mexico and, and countries all over the world, frankly, um, for different historic reasons. And so that's another thing that we recommend is trying to strengthen and do outreach to improve 
um, um, and and inspire the public to be involved with the the cause of journalists. And um, and then we also talk about uh, in, in this sort of intellectual roadmap. Um, getting back to the issue of government subsidies of um, of media, they really need to to take hopefully um, do away with that dependency that that exists. Uh, that would require creating a whole different sort of economic system for the media in Mexico, and then strengthening um, journalism communities at, at all these different levels, whether it's um, the international journalism organizations to individual, um, individual um, uh, involvement with more uh, local and regional organizations to even um, strengthening the ties between Organ, our networks, academic networks, and how we can improve, help to improve the situation by creating at least the visibility and letting people know about the networks that like the Red de Periodistas de Juarez or Periodistas de Apia in Mexico City and how much um, they are continually in need of support. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and I'll let Janine maybe um, talk about other uh, the other question that I, I'm not going to answer to give you some space, I talked too much. Oh, let's see, so uh, so we had um, the uh, going forward and then the question about comparisons and then there was a question in the middle that I... About um, the the theories of violence. Oh, theories, theories of, violence. of violence, yeah. So I think uh, that that is, uh, I, 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 I don't know if I would be the person to talk about that. I think I need to get into the theories of violence literature, but um, that is a really important question because uh, we have, you know, you're right, we've looked at um, a huge range of types of uh, categories of violence and, you know, a huge range of responses to violence. So uh, it would be interesting. Well, I think we'll have to take a look at that literature. I don't know, Celeste, if you're if you're familiar with that. And then just to add on to the other two uh, questions, um, just really quickly, uh, the one interesting thing <laughs> that is a little enigmatic is the networks part, which is so important, right? Any in any country, they're bankrolled by you know they thrive and they survive by funding. And so, you know, when the funding is cut off, uh, then those networks die. So one of the things that we, or they don't die, but they're not as, they're not as uh, robust. And, you know, so in the course of 10 years, what we saw was, you know, folks at first, it felt very, very grim, you know, and of course, part of that was just what folks were dealing with. And it was a, kind of the first time that things were so, so bad. I mean, bad, as bad as they were, um, but beyond endurance, uh, it I, it did look like I think the funding did ramp up and it, there was international funding and we did one of the phenomena that we did find was that journalists were saying hey we used to really be adverse to taking any money uh, you know working with organizations that had U S funding or other governments but a lot of U S money and uh, we've changed you know our minds on that just because you know hey we're out here and trying to survive so i mean article 19 you know the organization that's gathering all that data on violence and trauma and killings um, they're funded by the us government they're a london based group funded right now by us so and there are a lot of other projects like that so that's interesting and if the money dries up like the federal office in mexico uh, for the mechanismo, mechanismo, you know, responding to, you know, the government of Mexico responding to very adverse situations of journalists in Mexico, that office had a lot of money, millions of dollars of funding from the US government. So those things are going on. Um, so anyway, so hopefully, you know, in some cases that the funding would, the funding would continue on that. So and then with this respect to the US, um, yeah, there are a lot of similarities. I'll just throw out that one of the inhibiting factors for recovery from these types of violence in both Mexico, but I would uh, argue worse in the US is uh, the journalistic objectivity norm and putting themselves kind of in a third person space, uh, withdrawing from emotional intelligence and not really engaging with what's happening to them. And so it's hard to be um, 
holistically resilient <laughs> if you're, you know, if you have a barrier. And, uh, you know, first responders have those barriers, right? They, people don't fall apart when they're rescuing people in fires and that kind of thing. So that part is uh, a really interesting area that hasn't been investigated a lot. So that's an area, Mark, you might look at. Right. We, we did hierarchy of influences. That was our first paper on this subject. So yeah, it's useful. <laughs> <laughs> so I should uh, say one more big thank you for your interesting presentation, also encouraging people to go get the book and find more questions answered and other questions inspired by it. And uh, thanks to everybody for participating, questions, um, and um, yeah. Um, See you next time for our chalas. Thank you so much. Thanks, Celeste. Thanks, Janine, for having us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.